Thank you very much, uh, Professor De Robertis. Thank you, Professor Von Braun from the invitation, and also thank you, Professor Sonat, that is uh, inviting me to this session. It's a pleasure to be here. I will try to uh, connect uh, some of the things I've been doing in science with the general topic of the conference, which is basic sciences for development and planetary health. Yes. So one of the main topics I've been working uh, for the last three, three decades are how electrons are transferred from organic molecules to molecular oxygen to, gener to generate the energy needed to our biological functions. In that process, electrons flow to molecular oxygen to form water in the mitochondria, and also significant amounts of carbon dioxide. And then in that process, electrochemical gradients are generated and stored on the form of ATP. About 99% of the molecular oxygen that we consume in normal healthy mitochondria go to water via the four electron reduction, four electrons put into the oxygen molecule all the way into water. But there is a small percentage of electrons that leak out of the mitochondrial electron transport chain and another redox reaction giving rise to the generation of what we collectively know as reactive oxygen species, including superoxide, radical anion, O2 minus, and H2 2 hydrogen peroxide. These molecules can be redox signaling mediators as well as oxidative damage mediators, depending on levels and the antioxidant capacity and catabolic capacity of our cells. So one of the things that excess reactive oxygen species can do is to cause mitochondrial dysfunction. And mitochondrial dysfunction is a culprit of a series of pathologies, including neurodegeneration and even the aging process. So restoring mitochondrial redox homeostasis is a central focus for many of us working in redox medicine. So controlling the levels of ROS is important to, for, for the uh, balance between healthy and unhealthy tissues. And by the time many of these experiments were undergoing in the late 80s, early 90s, many investigators, including Professor Salvador Moncada, in different laboratories around the world, discovered another free radical, nitric oxide, which was discovered as a signaling molecule, mediating functions as a vasodilation, neurotransmission, modulation of inflammation. However, seeing the structure of NO, we know NO is a free radical, and superoxide is another free radical. So we thought maybe there are conditions by which these two free radicals react with each other. We know that radical radical reactions normally are diffusion control, so they are as fast as they can go in biology. So we proposed, together with Joe Beckman and Bruce Freeman, an alternative pathway for superoxide radical and NO, which is more linked to pathology, which is the superoxide, nitric oxide, radical, radical coupling reaction leading to the formation of peroxynitrite anion. Peroxynitrite now is recognized as a pathogenic mediator in a series of uh, events. And this scheme, and the only reason I show this is because this was a structured hypothesis that was tested by different investigators worldwide, in vitro and in vivo, every single step of that scheme has been tested and has been shown that it's a feasible mechanism to explain oxidative stress and decrease of NO signaling actions in vivo. And this is related to many pathologies. And eventually, this paper became a citation classic in 2013. So now we know that these uh, reactions occur in vitro and in vivo and are participating in diseases such as neurodegeneration, hypertension, diabetes, inflammation, and aging. And there is a lot of interest in redox-based medicine to control of this, including mitochondrial targeted therapies. But this scientific life changed a bit when I was coming back from a trip to the U from the USA, an academic trip, when in March, um, 11, uh, March 11, 2020, uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 pandemic was, was declared as a, a global outbreak. And then uh, our country declared the health emergency on March 13. During those weeks, a series of measures were taken, and the red one involved myself and many investigators directly, because in April, April we received a phone call from a top officer from the newly elected government. I have to say that I don't have any particular political ties 
with the current or past governments. They just wanted to create an ad hoc advisory group of scientists to help the health ministry to deal with the pandemic. So after a few days of thinking about it and talking to our university president, because I'm part of a major public university, and setting up some basic conditions to work, we created the uh, scientific advisory board with 60 scientists. Uh, in the, it was an interdisciplinary work. Uh, we created two branches. One was uh, data science and modeling. The other uh, uh, branch was uh, health. Uh, under the coordination of Professor Cohen, which is a clinician, Professor Paganini, who is a mathematician, and myself, I was working sort of as general coordinator. These 60 experts um, covered most areas of research, going from mathematics all the way to intensive care units. We created weekly reports that were public. That was one of the requests. They are actually 90 reports public in, in the presidency webpage. This was one of our fundamental requests. So that was brought a lot of credibility to the population. And we actually went to the parliament a few times to discuss about the selection of vaccine and the vaccination problem program. This was the structure of the so-called GACH. It's important to know that this was ad honorem for almost one and a half year. Many people was asking how much money are these scientists going to make? The answer was zero. This was a totally ad honorem work. And uh, there was a diversity of discipline, important discussions. This was an independent group. We didn't allow any political interference from any part of the political spectra. And there was a clear separation of roles. We gave the advice, and the, after discussion with the government, they made the decision. And we clearly saw during the pandemic that it was very clear to maintain a continuous and transparent communication with the society. Four accesses founded our work progressiveness, regulation, monitoring, and evidence, and all the public reports are in that web page. So some international journals uh, started to quote the Uruguayan experience. Remember that Uruguay is located, surrounded by two major countries, which were our Brazil and Argentina. Things were not so easy in those big countries. So for us, having big frontiers with both countries, we tried to behave as an island, but we were near New Zealand, so it was very hard to keep up the situation under control with all these challenges because of the frontiers. So one of the top journals uh, in Britain, the British Medical Journal, uh, wrote this editorial uh, in like uh, mid, late uh, 2020s. Of course, in 21, we also had a wave, but for the most of 2020, we were COVID free, and the wave started when vaccination started. So at the end of the day, uh, things were reasonable uh, in terms of what we were able to accomplish with very little restriction measures, I have to say. So Nature Medicine analyzed 28 countries in terms of the resilience and reactions of these countries to the pandemic. One of the 28 countries was Uruguay, as you can see there, and they highlighted the role of an independent interdisciplinary group of 60 sciences providing advice to the government and, and, and I think that was an important experience and gave a lot of credit and visibility to our local science people for the first time. Many people realized there is a scientific system in the country and it's worth uh, to support it to some extent. And there are many new people uh, going into the university, into science career after seeing uh, this a group of scientists acting over a 15 minute period. Another thing that uh, slightly Professor Arnold touched was the partisan division in the pandemics. So we were strong defenders with the public, in the parliament, and with the presidency to minimize partisan division during the pandemic because we consider this to be a risk factor. So we said it very clearly, and for the most part, I must have to say that for the most part, uh, all the spectra uh, was adhere, adhere, adhere to this idea and the partisan divisions would minimize and actually what the health uh, and, and scientists were proposing were followed for the most part of the pandemic in, I would say, scientific-based way. So the only reason I show this is was because this was one of the five national press conferences, because this was watched maybe by one third of the country live every time, and then it was reproduced. And this is the only time in the history of the country that three scientists were speaking to the public 
So I think that that was good for the scientific system, and people thought that the transparent communication was essential to follow uh, the adherence first, the non-pharmacological intervention measures, and then the vaccination plan. You can see Professor Paganini on the left, the mathematician, Professor Henry Cohen on the right, a uh, brilliant clinician working together in this press conference. At the end of the group, uh, there was an independent consultantship that did a survey on how the population perceived the scientific advice to the country. And as you can see, between muy bien and bien, which is good and very good, it was about 90% of the people independent of the party they were voting. And that was really good to know. It, it didn't matter it was left or right, 90% of the left and 90% of the right and 90% of the center said, we think this was a good experience. And this is the group. This is actually the first presential meeting we ever had after we resumed activities because all our work, most of our work was virtual. So there was a social meeting we had to celebrate the end of our work at the end of 2021. And then in the last three minutes, back to the basic. I worked in my career in bacteria, in parasites, in mammalian cells. I have never worked with virus. So I felt a bit uneasy. So we started to do a project with a group in collaboration with uh, a, a US investigators at Scripps Clinic and University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I built on what Professor Onuchik talked about the spike ACE interaction, which is a critical step for the virus to adhere and then to penetrate. So we said, can we disrupt the structure of the spike doing redox biochemistry so it doesn't really find the receptor? And can we doing that diminish infection? So I contributed this paper to PNAS together with the uh, US collaborators. And yes, if we do, instead of an oxidation, a reduction of protein disulfide, which are located in the receptor binding domain, the domain becomes very floppy. It doesn't bind as well to the ACE2 receptor, and then SARS-CoV-2 is not able to infect anymore. Some of these redox-based mucolytics are being utilized for, for other lung diseases. So there is a hope that this may eventually help for this or other coronavirus infection for treatment and diminish the attachment of the virus to this uh, lung surface. So just to round up, uh, just to show a few collaborators in the Uruguayan side uh, on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, project, my international collaborators, some of the international uh, and national funding agencies that have helped, and you can see a nice picture of the Montevideo Bay taken maybe 15 years ago. Thank you very much. For discussion. Salvador, Moncada. Thank you for that very interesting uh, presentation. I think it's uh, important to say that in the tragedy that the pandemic represented for Latin America, there's no doubt that uh, Uruguay was an example of uh, how to do the things well. And now we know why. So I think it was a, an important step that the government took. And uh, if it had been taken in other countries, probably it would have been uh, uh, better, the situation in general. But I think this is an opportunity to ask you a question about uh, the um, inflammation produced by the, the virus. It looks as if it is an explosive, very, very... Uh, um, free radical dependent inflammation, dependent on uh, M1 macrophage activation. And so it does in relation to the long COVID. Is uh, the initial inflammation, an M1 type dependent inflammation, which is explosive in that respect, and is the long COVID also of the same nature or not, or are they completely different types of uh, inflammatory reaction? I think that's an important difference, if there is any, to consider. Uh, thank you, Salvador. Yes, I believe that in the acute phase, as you say, M1 macrophages 
participate as well as a lot of neutrophil infiltration and there is a lot of oxidative damage and nitration of tissues. Uh, for the long COVID, I'm not so clear that this is being sorted out. I believe that there is some type of chronic inflammation, uh, some dysregulation of that process, um, lots of cytokines and interleukins being released at low level, uh, but I believe it, it's more like a combination of cell types, um, but I, I believe that it's not completely sorted out. In the late phase, sorry, in the late phase, the cytokines of the M1 macrophages predominate or not? That's the question. Or is an M2 type uh, repair process? In the long COVID. The questions? Well, then I, 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 oh yes, there in the back, the young person. <laughs> um, so I had a small question, because at the end you say that you um, want to break the, uh, the, reduce the protein disulfide bonds, uh, but uh, using redox reaction, but how would you go on to do that in practice without hurting like other proteins around? Yeah, yeah, maybe nice how do you important. how do you have a specificity yes, in the process? Yes, but it's only for that yeah, certain that's type a very protein. good question. That's a wonderful question. Yeah, you're talking about specificity because these, these reducing compounds may do many things in other disulfide, even from the host cell, and that can be very complicated. Um, on a, on a side comment, I must say that N-acetylcysteine, which is another redox-based molecule, is utilized clinically for cystic fibrosis, but that enters the lung. The mucolytics we were using are impermeable to the cell membrane, so they mainly work at the um, extracellular milieu uh, where um, the virus is trying to, to infect. When we do the proteomic analysis of the redox reactions, we see um, that for the most part, there are two disulfides that are preferentially reduced over all the other extracellular disulfides from the host and other disulfides from the spike. So we were able to fine tune the compounds and the dosages so that we are more specific and also these are non-cell permeable. And this is why some of these compounds are in the clinical trials for our lung disease. Thank you.